When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let us throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill the scripture he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so, he took a, so they took a sponge and, and put it in it and put it on a hyssop branch and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Spirit of God, if you are here, nothing else matters. And if you are not here, nothing else matters. May the same Spirit that inspired the writing of this story illumine our hearing of it today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the beginning, that's how the Gospel of John begins, in the beginning. I guess a beginning is always a good place to begin. Is there anything in this world more invigorating than to begin something? The artist stares at the canvas for several minutes before picking up her brush and making that first stroke of red across the blank white. Or the writer stares at the computer screen for minutes while the cursor blinks and blinks and blinks until finally he presses the first key and a story is born. Or the pianist sits down at the piano and takes a couple of breaths before she presses the first key and that note pierces the silence and something sacred happens. Or a young couple walks out of the hospital with a bundle of joy and a bundle of noise and a bundle of stink in their arms. They walk out to the car and the nurse corrects the car seat. Of course they had it installed incorrectly. You can only install them incorrectly at first. And the mother climbs into the back seat next to her daughter while the father drives home at a maximum speed of 26 miles an hour. Or the family walks up onto their front porch of their house. Their house. There was a time in their life where they wondered if they would ever be able to say that. But they stand there on the front porch and jingle their keys just to hear the sound of it. And they insert the key into the knob on the front door and open the door. Is there anything in life more invigorating than to begin something. John says, in the beginning, which should evoke memories in a, the sacred mind, the Jewish mind of Genesis 1, the blankest of canvases, when God began to speak, and it was, and it was, and it was, and it was. I guess God could have done it any old way. God could have shaped our reality the way a potter shapes clay. Or God could have pulled out a cosmic hammer and nails and built our reality. But Genesis says God spoke. And in the speaking of it, it was so. And John picks up on this. John says, hear these words. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. And yet the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. So Jesus came to us as the Word of God. Not words about God. But the Word, the message of God. To show us God's good and true intentions before the foundations of the world. He came to give life and to show us all what the possibilities of life really are. He came as a, a light to illumine the way for us because He was indeed the way for us. But the darkness did not understand Him. He came to show us a new beginning, but we are awfully good in defense mechanisms to protect ourselves from anything new, any new beginning. Our eyes have become so accustomed to the darkness that when the light shines, it almost prohibits our seeing as much as it enables it. We're not used to the light. Our lives have so shrunk beneath the powers of death that when real abundant life makes its way to us, it scares us to death. Because the darkness did not comprehend Him, it tried to get rid of Him. What is the crucifixion? if not an attempt to extinguish the light so that we can shrink back into our darkness? What is the crucifixion if not an attempt to silence the Word so that we can get back to all of our words? What is the crucifixion if not an attempt to exterminate life itself so that we can fall back into the comfortable routines that we usually call life? They crucified Jesus because they wanted nothing of a new beginning. They wanted the same old. And if I'm honest, most days I do too. At first glance, it appears as though the darkness accomplished their purposes. They crucified Him, and from the cross He cried, It is finished. I can imagine how that sounded in the ears of the onlookers that day at the cross. You're watching the life slowly ebb out of this man. Breathing his last breath, you hear him say, It is finished. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. It is finished. The sand has run out of the hourglass. The hands of the clock are no longer ticking. It's over. The end. Finished. But the word finished can and does mean something much more than an ending. The word that Jesus spoke from the cross in the Gospel of John is tetelestai. It's from the Greek word telos, which means end or finished. But, but it doesn't just mean ended as in over. It carries the connotation that something has been fulfilled or completed. Something has been carried out to the full. The last time we encounter the word telos is in John chapter 13. The disciples were gathered in a room shortly after Jesus had entered Jerusalem that grand triumphal entry day. And John says in chapter 13, Jesus, knowing that His hour had come and that He was about to depart this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He now loved them to the end or some translations say He loved them to the uttermost. But the word in John 13, 1 is telos. Jesus loved them to the telos. And so, having loved His own to the end, He rose from the table and wrapped a towel around His waist and filled a basin with water and one by one by one by one began washing the feet of His disciples. This activity was typically reserved for the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of slaves. It was below an entry-level position. And yet Jesus did this, the text says, as a culmination, a fulfillment of God's love. This is the greatest expression of what our God is like. 
After he finished, Jesus rose to his feet and he turns to his disciples and he says, Do you know what I've done for you? Do you understand? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But if I, your teacher and Lord, wash your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. All of this was to fulfill, to be the telos of the love of God for all creation. And then at the cross, Jesus says, It is finished, completed, fulfilled. He had come as the definitive word from God, the definitive voice of God. His words were God's words, whether He spoke them or lived them. If you wanted to know what God was like, the cross in Christ had the final word. You know as well as I do that there are a number of people out there speaking about God with great confidence today. TV preachers pronounce God's blessing and God's condemnation as if it's theirs to give. And they proclaim God's will as if they know it with certainty. There are theologians who speculate about this and about that, and oftentimes they're diametrically opposed to each other. And there's a great deal of pop religion that says a million different things about God. But in the cross, the Word said those words that should put a bit of a hush over all of our shouting and all of our theologizing. God's Word, as it is seen in the cross, it's finished. If you want to know what God is like, behold, it's finished. And He came to us as the light of the world to illumine the way of God because He was the way. And that way led to a cross because that way always leads to a cross. Because it's about suffering and sacrifice. It's about giving rather than receiving, which is a way of dying in our culture and pretty much any culture. Now everyone has their ways. Families have their ways. Churches have their ways. Schools have their ways. Cultures, political parties, countries... Everyone has their ways. There are a multiplicity of ways in the world. But on the cross, we see the way. The way made ultimate. It is finished. This is the way. If you want to know the way, it's finished. And He was life. That life which found its fulfillment on the cross, which sounds so absurd to say, if the cross represented anything in the ancient world, it was a symbol of death. And yet, earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the life. The cross reveals in body and action what Jesus had tried to reveal through His words, that the way to life is the way of death. Once you die to living on your own terms, then you're liberated. The horizons expand. To open, to, to live in the ways of God. Many people live lives measured in all sorts of ways. People measure life in all sorts of ways. Rene Descartes and the Enlightenment thinkers who followed him believed that the measure of human life was rational thought. The smarter you were, the better you were. You can see it in Descartes' famous dictum I think, therefore I am. It's rational thought which makes us human beings. Some people think of life as measured by the number of great experiences they can have. And so they endure the weeks to get to the weekends. They endure their jobs to get to the vacations. They endure the daily monotony to get to the extraordinary and the miraculous. The only problem is we have more weekdays than weekends. We have more work days than vacations. And we certainly have much more mundane than we have miraculous. And so most of these people are waiting to live their lives which they'll never get to. They're missing out on life in the way that they understand living. But the cross would show us a different way, a different life. The cross would show us 
that we don't live to the extent that we think, nor do we live to the extent that we produce a certain amount of adrenaline. But we live to the extent that we love. The gospel would say to us, I love, therefore I am. And to the extent that love is life to us, Jesus cries from the cross to tell us, die, it is finished, for this is love to the uttermost. There is no greater love. The cross is the place where people find the way and the truth and the life that they have been searching for, even if they don't know it, even if they can't articulate it. It's at the cross that we find everything that we need. It has been f finished, fulfilled, accomplished, completed at the cross. I know this because John tells us. I know this because from the cross Jesus tells us. I also know this because I've seen it. I have seen people come to the cross as self-absorbed and narcissistic as they could be. They came to the cross asking, now what can I get out of this? Only there at the cross to experience the power and the joy and the peace that comes from giving away the self. And they found the wherewithal to begin doing it themselves and they were forever changed by what they saw at the cross. I have seen people come to the cross as beat down as they could be, doubting the worth of their own humanity, only to see Jesus show them the full extent of God's love. And they left with chin up and heart open and walked out into a brand new world. I have seen people come to the cross weighed down by guilt and shame, weighed down by the worst things they've ever done, only at the cross to find forgiveness and renewal. And they were forever changed. They could breathe. What a weight lifted off their shoulders. I have seen people come to the cross looking for an identity. Who am I in this world? They've asked that question all their lives and they've busied themselves with all sorts of activity. This will tell me who I am. This will tell me who I am. This will tell me who I am. And all the while, they've expanded their circumference of doing. But the cross says, no, no, no. It's not doing that tells you who you are. It's being. Don't expand your circumference. Deepen your center. You are children of God. Go and live like it. I have seen people come to the cross doubting the character of God because they listen to bad PR or maybe because of life's bumps and bruises and they wondered where God is in the mess of it all. Only for Jesus from the cross to say, do you really want to know what God is like? Behold, what God is like. Whew. And they went away knowing not just that God was great, but that God, God is good and His only love. I have seen people come to the cross with all their common sense only to discover at the cross the foolishness of God and to come to grips that the foolishness of God is wiser than all of our wisdom put together. I have seen people come to the cross searching rationally for the truth only to discover that at the cross truth is not discerned rationally, it's discerned relationally. For us Christians, truth is not a what, but a who. And therefore, truth is only gained in relationship, not just in hard thinking. I have seen people come to the cross with their carefully calculated pint-sized loves, only to discover a love that knows no depth or bound. It is wild and free. And they went away loving in different ways. I have seen people come to the cross asking cynically, how can we know the will and way of God? Only to see Jesus with arms stretched wide say, here it is and it is finished. 
over and over again. I have seen people come to the cross one way and leave another, different, transformed, we might even say converted, which is the individual equivalent of a revolution. In that way, the cross might just be the most powerful thing I've ever beheld. It transforms the personal and the social all at the same time. It shapes the depths of our souls and the far reaches of the cosmos at the same time. It confronts the darkness within and the powers and principalities without at the same time. It accomplishes what we cannot on our own. It accomplishes what we could not on our own. And it is the final, finished, completed Word. It's the final Word of Jesus' life. The final Word on darkness. The final Word on life and death. The final Word on pride and evil. And it is the final, ultimate Word on love. And the truth is, we cannot add much to it. The truth is, we can't take much away from it. The truth is, all we can do is show up with our hands open and our arms outstretched. But the moment we see it for what it is, it changes everything. And by that I mean it changes everything. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It was the ending which spawned a billion beginnings. It was the fulfillment which enabled a billion possibilities. It was the death which birthed a billion lives. Yours and mine amongst them. Thanks be to God. For the place where Jesus' life ended is precisely the place where all of our lives begin. Hallelujah. Would you pray with me? Lord, we've welcomed you into Jerusalem today. And we've welcomed you into our church in our own hearts. In so doing, we've welcomed new beginnings. We've welcomed a way that's different than all of our ways. A truth that challenges all other truths. And a life which makes all other, other lives pale in comparison. Frankly, O oh Lord, Your way scares us a bit. And we know today that there is a reason that those who welcomed You on Sunday were calling for Your death by Friday. Sometimes we find our own voices amidst theirs. But we invite Your cross into our lives anew today, O oh Lord. That we could find the way and the truth and the life in our ways and truths and lives. And that we might be Your people. You finished it. And for that we praise You and worship You. But for that, we also follow you. For where you finished, we begin. Help us to step anew today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.